With me today, Conservative MEP Daniel Hannan, Labour peer Lord Adonis, Theresa May's former Director of Communications Katie Perrier and Spike to online columnist Ella Whelan. So, what's going on today? We are a Remain and Reform Party, but obviously when it comes to a deal, people could form their own view. If Labour's deputy leader is right, why would the party do a deal with the Tories to get Brexit over the line? My six-year-old actually couldn't wait to go into school on Friday morning last week to say, it's mummy councillor now, it's not, it's not mummy. Why independents were the big winners at the local elections? Fancy £16,000 a year from the government? No questions asked. We'll tell you how. Right, let's start with those cross-party talks resuming this week. The question to all of you is, Daniel Hannan starting with you, will they last the week? No, I, I think Labour's now made it very clear that they don't want a deal without a second referendum attached. Uh, the, the, the People's Party is openly disdaining the people. You know, Labour will do anything for the working man except listen to him. And that makes it pointless to carry on with the talk, since plainly there isn't going to be any room for an agreement there. So if there has to be another parliamentary vote, let's hold the wretched thing. If not, let's drop the pretense and move on. Do you think the cross-party talks have any chance <coughs> of lasting the week and succeeding? Well, the people can't betray the people, so it's absolutely the democratic thing for there to be a second referendum on any Brexit deal, uh, including one from Theresa May. But on, on the talks themselves, I oh. see that Jeremy Hunt, the France Secretary, said in, uh, in Brussels earlier this morning that so there were discussions going on, and whilst it was the government's position that they didn't want to see a second referendum, these negotiations would continue. So it sounds as if Daniel's party isn't being as categoric in its uh, denial of the possibility of a deal as, as he might think. And it's been clear for a long time what the compromise would be. The Parliament agrees to pass her deal, because otherwise Theresa May will have no way forward at all, but in return for a second referendum with an option to remain. And that's looking more and more clear that it's a, a likely... So but just to be clear, there would therefore be no leave option on the ballot paper. It would be a choice between a deal that leave is regarded as worse than either staying or leaving or not remaining. Not, An actual clean break wouldn't be on the ballot right, paper. Right, that's right. what Daniel thinks, but that's not the case, of course. There would obviously be a remain option on the ballot paper. Do you think the talks will last the week, Katie? No, and I think the patience is really running out from the Conservative Party end, and there's pressure on the Prime Minister now to say, how much longer are you going to put faith into these talks to, to, to say that you're going to get something out of the end of it? Because you lose face the longer it goes on, because one way or another it has to come to an end. And I think we are seeing the end of days now, and it's about what comes next. Right, but the noise is that actually there is a point to these talks, that they have been serious and they've been done in good faith. Oh, yeah, but that's, so that's what they say, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, they want to seem like they are doing something, both sides, but these talks should never have taken place, from my point of view, in the first place, because it was all about both Labour and Conservatives trying to come together to find a way to best scupper Brexit however you look at it, and from this Leaver's point of view, uh, any outcome that does anything other than honour the referendum and accept the referendum and implement the referendum in its fullness is a sellout. So whether, that, whether we are facing a confirmatory referendum, which would be a complete uh, dishonest approach to democracy and a travesty, or it's some kind of Frankenstein's monster of a deal, Leaver's lose out. But hold on a minute, Theresa May can't win either way, because we moaned that she didn't do anything to engage with people all the way through the first part of the process and try to get her deal through herself, and now we moan that she tries to reach out across Parliament to try and engage. So she can't win on this and needs to decide whether or not she thinks she can be rescued by the Labour Party, or she needs to go on regardless. Well, we're going to talk about this in some detail. Let's um, show our viewers the Guardian um, newspaper. Second Brexit referendum key to deal, says Starmer, Keir Starmer, the shadow Brexit secretary. I'm going to talk to Andrew Adonis for a while, just a few questions before I open it up to everybody else. Do you agree with Keir Starmer um, that there are about 150 MPs or so on the Labour side that would not agree to any Brexit deal unless it includes a second referendum? I entirely agree. And indeed, I think that underestimates the number, because on the 1st of April, more than 200 Labour MPs voted for there to be uh, a referendum on any Brexit deal with an option to remain, any Brexit deal. So I think it's unsustainable for there to be an agreement. So you don't think there are think any the circumstances, right, so there are no circumstances at all in which Labour would assist the Conservatives in delivering Brexit or a Brexit deal without a second referendum? Well, I was simply saying what I think the majority of Labour MPs, what their view would be, and I think the great majority of Labour MPs would not agree to any Brexit deal without there being a referendum with an option to remain. It's, it's very clear now that you couldn't conceivably hold a referendum where the only choice is the least popular things in the country, which so are different So you would categorise the Labour Party as the party of a second referendum, remain and reform, says Tom Watson. I completely agree with Tom. Right. I, think, I think Tom is speaking, you have it. Is, Tom is speaking for the Labour Party. Right. Well, fundamental well, dishonesty there. Well, right? At on, the 2017 election, all those Labour MPs were returned to Parliament on the basis of a clear manifesto promise that they would respect the result. Now, in fairness, the SNP, the Greens, the Lib Dems, they all said they were going to overturn it. They all lost votes in consequence. But Labour told an outright lie. They said, we will respect the referendum result, and they now turns out they had their fingers right, well, on Andrew, you made it very clear, and Dan obviously disagrees. You've made it very clear that, in your mind, Labour is the party of the second referendum and remain. In fact, you went even further last year on LBC. Let's just have a listen. If you're a Brexiter, I hope you won't vote for the Labour Party because the Labour Party is, is moving increasingly against right. Brexit. 30 to 40% so, of Labour that, Party voters support yeah, Brexit. Yeah, but well, by definition, therefore, the majority were against Brexit. One does the maths so, so on that here. So why would any Labour Leave voter support you when you say you are fully committed to a second referendum and remain? If we have a referendum, 
Everyone who voted Leave or Remain three years ago gets their say. So I hope that Leavers and Remainers will vote Labour in the European elections because it's the only way that they will get their own say. Why would they not vote for the Brexit Party? I mean, Andrew Jones, well, why Brexit would Party anybody isn't. who wants to vote Leave and who wants the UK to leave in the way that they said they were promised and they said clearly in that referendum, why would they vote for Labour? You've just said we're the party mm. of Remain and a second the referendum. The Brexit Party isn't offering people a, a say at all. The Brexit Party just wants an impossible position, mm. which is a no-deal Brexit, to be adopted, even though there are virtually no votes in Parliament for it. But I mean, you've, to you've, told Labour, no you've told Labour... So, Leave voters not to bother voting no, for Labour. the Labour Party. You've told anybody who wants to leave who's a Brexiter not to vote for the Labour Party. You've said you're the party of Remain and a second Labour. referendum. Why would anybody who wants to leave the EU vote for Labour? I, I've answered that question very clearly. If there's a referendum and people who voted Leave and Remain... They do. The great majority of people do want a referendum. That's very clear from the polling. And if there's a referendum, people who voted Leave and Remain both get their right. say and they get an equal say. Well, and those who want a no-deal Brexit, which is what the Brexit Party is campaigning for at the moment, the only way it's going to be possible to get that is through a referendum, because there's no way that the current right. House of Commons... Is Labour... Is Labour, it, though, in favour of a second referendum in the way that you have stated? I mean, you've made it pretty categorical. I've looked at your leaflet in the European elections and your manifesto. I really struggled to find any mention of a second referendum. There's one mention of a public vote it's in the, here. It's the key mention, which is that on any deal from this government. But what Keir was saying in The Guardian this morning, which you asked me about earlier, what Keir was saying is that he finds it inconceivable that there could be an agreement with the government, but that's what an Keir agreement between the but parties, about, if, which, which didn't have right, a referendum. Well, let's just see what there, Labour's there actually the saying. Right? You're saying one thing. Let's have a look at the European manifesto from the Labour Party. Labour will continue to oppose the government's bad deal or a disastrous no deal. And if we can't get agreement along the lines of our alternative plan or a general election, so if they do get agreement, they won't back the option of a public vote. No, they don't say that. No, the words don't say that. Well, what the, they, no, what if the, we can't what get agreement say. along the lines of our alternative plan or a general election, only then will Labour back a public vote. No. So it's not in all circumstances. Hold on. We, we don't say whether or not in the manifesto there would be a, a referendum on any deal other than the government's, that, that would need to be decided at the time. What Keir was saying this morning is that he believes that the great majority of Labour MPs would want a referendum in those circumstances. However, if there's Theresa May's deal proceeds, mm. and let's be clear, that is the only deal on the table. No, but hang on. There's no but other deal is, on the table. I'm sorry, Andrew, you're not, you're not being honest. In around. your leaflet it says if we can't get changes to their bad deal or a yeah. general election, I, changes, yeah, but mm. changes to the deal, that's why the talks are continuing, mm. then Labour would back the option of a public vote. It's not guaranteed. Mm. But you're making my point that it, the only deal on the table at the moment is Theresa May's deal. That deal, we support a referendum with an option to remain. If there were to be some alternative deal, mm. obviously we'd have to take a view at the time and what uh, Keir Starmer and Tom Watson have been saying right, so it's not is he thinks the great majority of But it's not guaranteed. Let's have a look president. at your Twitter page where you say the choice is between Farage, Nigel Farage and Brexit mm. or People's Vote and Labour. But that is disingenuous. That is not what Labour is saying as has been demonstrated by the manifesto and the leaflet. If Labour get changes to the deal, then Brexit will happen along Labour lines. There'll be no second referendum. The only deal on the table at the moment is Theresa May's deal. It's been voted down by the House of Commons three times and Labour has voted now, not only against Theresa May's deal three times, but for a, a right, referendum. So why is it twice. not emblazoned so, across the front of your manifesto and the front of your leaflet? Well, we simply, Second referendum under Labour. Uh, well, I wish it was, because that is our policy, is that on Theresa May's deal, we support a referendum. Instead, we have Jeremy's picture, and that's great, because Jeremy's the leader of our party, so instead we've got Jeremy emblazoned. That's, that's, that's fantastic. But on the actual policy matter that, you say that affects fantastic. us at the moment... You say it's fantastic, but you, tweeted, but you tweeted earlier this year the only thing that could lead the independent group to become a viable party is Jeremy Corbyn literally forcing the sensible left out of the Labour Party by continuing to condone Brexit and anti-Semitism. The Jeremy's trouble is, doing he's doing a very good job of this. No, Jeremy's not doing that. Right, you've changed your no, mind. You've changed Jeremy, your mind since February. No, what Jeremy has done has led us three times to vote against Theresa May's deal and twice to back a referendum. On the 1st of April, the last time the House of Commons voted on What's a referendum... What's changed since February from voted, your tweet? Oh, the, the way that Jeremy's led the party. In the 1st of April, he led more than 200 Labour MPs to vote for a referendum on mm. any Brexit deal with an option to remain. So the only way we're going to get Remain and a referendum is by supporting Labour in these elections. Really, if you were a Remain supporter and you really wanted a second referendum, why wouldn't you support change? UK. Because they've, got, the Liberal because they've got they've got tiny support in the House of Commons and the country. If you actually want to bring about change, then you have to support Labour in this election. This is just Labour painful. I mean, I, 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 I've Commons. been on the opposite side of, of, from Lord Adonis for years, but I, I actually just find it painful. I, I wonder whether Seamus Milne and Jeremy Corbyn haven't put him on the list for the sole purpose of torturing and humiliating him by making him say all of these things and disavow all the stuff that he'd been saying up until now, which is the only issue that counted was stopping a referendum. I mean, it, it's just painful to watch. But the one thing I really wanted to pick up was his idea that it's either Labour or the Brexit party. There must be space for people who want Brexit to happen in a liberal, agreed, orderly and grown-up way. Not every lever is, uh, is for a, the hardest kind of aggressive uh, future relationship with the EU. We, most of uh, the people who voted Leave want to have good and cordial relations with our European neighbours after we've left. And there must be a space. The reason why I decided I had to stand again. There must be a space for people to say vote Brexit and vote for it to happen in a friendly, orderly and swift way. Ella? I applaud your attempt to make a case for the Conservative view of Brexit. I think it's quite honestly saying that that's um, a long shot at this point. I want to come back on the second referendum point. I mean, 
fair enough, asking a lord to understand and defend democracy is a bit like asking a butcher to campaign for veganism. It's not your shtick. I mean, I know that you don't quite get it, but let me put it to you this way. If we have a confirmatory vote, a second referendum, a people's vote, however you want to dress it up, what that is saying is you have to ask, you're asking voters to beg for their political views. And there's no, uh, there's no guarantee that that wouldn't happen again and again and again. We have already had, I know you're sort of sick of hearing this by now, but I'm going to be one of those pesky voters that reminds you of what happened in, 20, in 2016. We had this vote, we had our say, and it is now incumbent on politicians to implement that vote. What we have at the moment is parties vying for the power of how best to completely rewrite history and pretend like that didn't happen. So you're, going to vote second, for the, you're going to vote for the Brexit party? I'm going to vote for the Brexit party, and I tell you that was a hard decision for me to make as someone on the left, because I've, I'm, I'm ashamed and uh, appalled by the fact that the left has so um, exited this discussion in relation to the Euroscepticism on the left as something now that's seen as, you know, it was, the, it was a, a central tenet of left-wing viewpoints. But the reason I'm voting for the Brexit party is because it is putting forward a clear message on democracy, on democracy, the key issue of our time, and Brexit is what has galvanised politics and is what interests people. And if you don't understand that, then you may as well leave politics. And what do you say listening to that, Katie? Um, and also, if you look at the latest opinion poll, which puts the Brexit party on 34%, with Labour tracking behind on 21%. I think it's tapped into the angry nature of the electorate right now. They're not just angry because Brexit has not been implemented. They're angry because our politicians are all having a row within ourselves inside the West to bubble and we are not reaching them. If you live in Hull or Middlesbrough, you might as well live in France or Germany right now for the fact that we feel so far apart from where we are. And we need to work out a way together, not just the Conservative Party, but across the board. Because the Labour Party has shown today you're a split on the issue of Brexit as anybody else is in Parliament right now. And, you know, it was painful listening to that interview. And it's painful to be at home listening to all of this going on week after week after week. Every week people open up the Sunday papers and think, right, well, this is a week something's got to happen. Something's got to break. You can't be in the cul de sac forever. There must be a way out. And every week we find ourselves stuck in exactly the same point. Well, and on that, and on the pain being felt by many people. Um, Dan Hannan, you wrote an article in The Telegraph over the weekend calling on Theresa May to go. Why? Mm. Well, by all the rules of politics, she should have gone, if not after the last election, then certainly when she suffered the worst parliamentary defeat in, you know, 700 and whatever years of <laughs> parliamentary history. Uh, it seems to me that the process of recovery for the Conservative Party, but more important, the process of getting an equitable deal that works for both sides on Brexit can't begin until there is someone else in place. And unless this issue is addressed within the next few days, I'm not sure there is going to be a Conservative Party left to inherit for whoever the successor is. Is that right? I think that she needs to announce the date that she goes, whether or not that's, you know, very soon or whether or not that's a couple of months' time. I can't believe we will be heading to Conservative Party conference in the autumn and she's going to put herself up in front of those people which are likely to slow clap her, turn their backs on her, tell her that that's, she's not the leader of their party that they want. And I think that between now and then we have to have a moment for departure, a clear time for a decent leadership contest. I was asked the other day, you know, do we have, a, do we have as a Conservative Party in us to be able to offer hope and vision for the future and a way through this? And I think we do, but we're running out of time. And it requires someone with the ability to communicate, and this is what's been absent. I mean, actually, there's a fairly good story to tell in normal times, right? The, the, the deficit is back to pre Gordon Brown levels, there are more people working than ever, you know, school standards are rising, wages are rising, but you you need someone able to communicate a sense of Who vision. Who would that be, Dan? Like, do you know, as soon as you start picking sides there, everything else you say is discounted, so I'm going to leave that one to the MPs. What, I don't get a vote to what it. We're no, but... is, what we're hearing is the implosion of the Conservative Party at the moment, because they want to pull the rug from under Theresa May, they can't say who else it should be, and they've got no way forward on Brexit. And the Labour Party so, really so should whole, be so 20 points ahead right now. The Labour Party should be 20 points ahead right now, and it's, it really is a massive but, failure of leadership to not be ahead of this government. Well, there's, in there's no greater failure of leadership than not fulfilling properly the office of Prime Minister. Yes, but as the recent elections in the local showed, you weren't making gains in the way that you should have been as an opposition party. But let's return to the Tories. Well, absolutely. You know, they've got a mauling at 1,300 seats being lost. But, Dan, you say that the, the, the Tories' problem is the leader and that Theresa May should go in a matter of days, yes. in your mind. Do you then think the rules need to change in terms of getting rid of her? If she won't uh, step down voluntarily, then yes. I mean, up until, otherwise the whole party gets judged. It's like the ancient mariner's crewmates. They, they make themselves accomplices if they don't act. Uh, the, the, the Cabinet, the 22, the Parliamentary Party, somebody has to change the rules uh, and move if she won't go herself, which I still think would be by far the best thing. She did, by the way... I mean, the, the absurdity of all this is everyone agrees that she should go soon, including, in theory, Mrs May. Right? She said, I don't want to lead us into another European election. Uh, I won't be the Prime Minister who's there if, if Brexit hasn't happened sure. by June. So we're only arguing about a few weeks. That's the, that's the preposterousness of this. But those few weeks the may make all the difference. I'm not a fan of changing the rules. I don't like the play, changing the rules while you're in the game. I think that's pretty poor form. Uh, I hope that she will listen to Cabinet colleagues who are kind of saying to her, time is starting to be up now. We've tried every possible route. We've allowed you time to negotiate with the Labour Party, even though we've taken a knock for it. You know, speaking to local councillors out on the ground in the last few weeks, they are livid that Theresa May has been negotiating Brexit with the Labour Party. And they're pretty furious about it. So I think that hopefully they will be protecting the party just as much as protecting her.
Uh, to, at the risk of being the one that sounds a bit soft on Theresa May, I just don't see what this would change. I mean, uh, the, the idea that it would take someone who would be a better communicator, I mean, you have to have a good message to communicate. Okay, and at the a, moment, a great at the, moment the Conservative Party, neither the Labour Party, have a good message to communicate. The message that people are crying out for is one of democracy, and both mm. parties are failing on that. All issue. right, well, let's have a look at some of the polling. In fact, we're going to have a look at an average of European election polling. I think we can show you and our viewers. Brexit Party on 30%, Labour on 24%, and the Conservatives on 13%, Lib Dems on 13%. We're going to talk to Andrew Hawkins from Comrade. Um, they carried out a poll uh, that featured in the Telegraph over the weekend. Just give us a sort of summary of those polls ahead of the European elections. Well, for uh, the European election voting intention poll, we had the Conservatives um, alarmingly for them on fourth, in fourth place on just 11%, uh, and the Brexit Party up at, at 28%. Um, the, the, the real worry, I think, for the Conservatives, though, is that we, we put them in third place behind the Brexit Party. The Conservative vote share um, that we had was the lowest of any pollster since January 1995. And if it was to translate into a general election, of course, it is only a snapshot in time, but if it were to translate into a general election, number right. of seats in the House of Commons, then the Brexit Party would be winning almost 50. Right, and we're just showing um, our guests and our viewers um, those figures there with Westminster uh, voting intention. Um, I mean, would a change of leader make any difference, Andrew? We tested that as well. Um, if there were any leadership candidates uh, still with their seats after such a, a result, if they were to change, change uh, riders now, um, the, only, the only leader, potential leader that, that we tested who would come within a whisker of, uh, of Labour for the Conservatives would be Boris Johnson, but he, the Conservative Party would still be behind Labour um, even if he were to uh, become leader. And it's worth noting as well that Boris Johnson not only is the most popular but he also polls as the, the least popular, so he, he, he receives the, the greatest dislike score. Right. I mean, there are normal health warnings always, of course, uh, with polls, and as you said, the Westminster voting intention is a snapshot, but it, it looks pretty terminal for the Conservatives if you take all these figures in the round. I think it's really, it's really difficult. I mean, the, the first past the post will ride to their rescue, and it's worth looking back to what happened with the SDP alliance in the early 80s. One poll in 1981 gave the alliance 50% of the vote. Uh, in the 83 election, they were two percentage points behind Labour in the high 20s, but Labour won ten times as many seats in Westminster as they did. We've still got the same uh, electoral system in, in place, and I, that would doubtless uh, work very hard ag against the Brexit Party's interests were they to be able to maintain this, uh, this conjuring act of, uh, of, 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 of trying to levitate their vote share until the next election, whenever it happens to be. Right. I mean, Dan Hannan, you also say in your article, uh, May, Theresa May's refusal to go in the next two weeks really could mean the end of the Conservative Party after 200 years. Mm. Um, 350 if you count the Tory prelude. Yeah. Really? You see it as badly Yes. That? I mean, the idea that people are gaming this and saying, oh, well, you know, is, is what's the right time for my preferred candidate is terrifying. We, we're a two-party system. What happens, as Andrew Hawkins was saying just there, if one party loses, the other one wins. So the issue for people, by the way, the issue for people even voting next week is who do you want in charge? Who do you want in charge during the Brexit process? Do you want it to be Jeremy Corbyn or whoever takes over from Theresa May? And I mean, I, I'm very clear in my mind as to, to, to who would be better there. But there's the whole issue of do we really want the country led by someone who has never found an anti-British dictator that he doesn't support? Katie? Um, I think the Conservative Party have been through many problems before, possibly not as serious as this issue in terms of Brexit, but um, it has got the ability to re kind of rebirth, reborn, you know, get, get through and change... So it is in tatters in your mind, the brand? Oh, yes, I think the brand is in tatters. I think David Cameron's efforts to detoxify the party are shot to pieces now. And I'm, I'm afraid we have a real building exercise to go. But when you look at the Labour Party, I'm afraid that it's not like they're just... The people, voters are going, the alternative is so much better. We are rushing to the polls to get Jeremy Corbyn behind the, the door at number 10. That is not the case either. I think this is uh, the central question about the, what these elections will show is that voters are screaming out for something different. I mean, the Brexit Party, like the Molumpton, has just come out of sort of thin air. It's only recently announced itself and it's people are flocking towards it. And I don't think that's because it's running flashy campaigns or it's got, you know, loudspeakers at its events and it's got all of that going for it. It's because people really care about Brexit. And but that's the central thing. That, and the most important thing, the most after important, that, I'm afraid. So you're one track party that doesn't do anything perhaps, and I, I certainly am... I, I think it's very dangerous. I certainly you, am treating yeah. this as a, as a vote in, on a single issue and when it comes to general election, I might think very differently. But what people are sick of is being asked to vote for the best of the worst option. So yeah, you're playing politics playing tactics. People don't want to do that anymore. They want to take up a central issue. Okay, you say it's over then, but Nigel Farage has been talking about going beyond uh, the European elections, going towards a general election. It may not be over um, in terms of the threat from the Brexit party, but the Conservatives... It may not be over, but until I see policies and spending commitments on the NHS, on the schools, on how you deal with adult social care, all the things that politicians have to deal with, um, uh, I, would, I would only think that it is one... Or, or even, it's even Brexit. Yeah. Beyond, I mean, of course, you don't need to be a, a brilliant analyst to work out that people voted Leave, we haven't left, and therefore people are going to vote for a party called Brexit. But I hope that people will also think about what happens next, right? I always saw Brexit 
not as an end in itself, but as a means to an end. For me, the end is a freer and more democratic and more prosperous global Britain. And the reason I want to be in the European Parliament is to try and make that happen. And so you, you've got to think about, do we just get something off our chests, or are we actually in this in terms of getting oh, yeah, an outcome that is accurate? Let me just stand up and put two fingers up in Parliament. Well, that's not really right. good for Britain, is it? That doesn't take us in places in the future, and that's why I worry about. Dan Daniel was the person who told us there was no one questioning our position in the single market. So I, d I think on this Brexit issue, we've moved on a long way since then, because the position we're now in is the Brexit Party has taken over a large part of the Conservative Party's support. Let's be clear, the reason why the Brexit Party is doing so well, because it's done a reverse takeover of the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. What it's done is yanked oh. the Conservative Party largely in the direction of a no-deal Brexit. So people are increasingly looking at Labour as the only voice of moderation and sanity in the whole political spectrum at the moment. Right, but shouldn't you be grateful to the Brexit Party then, Andrew Dennis, on these figures? They would split the Tory vote in a general election and allow Jeremy Corbyn into number yeah, But we've got this big issue before of what we do with Brexit, and that is the single biggest issue facing the country. And to those on the left, the message is very clear. We will not get social justice, the end of austerity, and those things that we want to see in terms of tackling climate change, building houses and all of that, if we spend the next that, ten... That little years, yes, in that little yes, Lord of is hugely significant. Well, if there are any Conservatives voting well, who think, OK, we can give them a little slap next week and it doesn't really count, the idea that Corbyn doesn't trampoline out of a big election success at the European elections into Downing Street, the idea that this is a completely free hit, that it doesn't have any consequence in the real world, I really hope people think about Of course it has a consequence in the real world. Winning elections is the path to power. That's why I hope people will vote Labour, because at the moment we've got one of the most disastrous governments in office in the history of this country, which all our Conservatives here does. They want to remove the leader of We've come full circle, I think. Um, thank you to Andrew Hawkins for filling us in on the latest polling figures. Um, there was another big change that happened at the local elections recently, and that was the rise of independence. Our reporter, John Owen, went to Ashfield in Nottinghamshire to find out what happened there. I don't come from a, a privileged background or anything like that. I'm just a normal average Joe, to be fair. My six-year-old actually couldn't wait to go into school on Friday morning last week to say, it's mummy councillor now, it's not, it's not mummy. I was a member of the Labour Party for 23 years, worked for the Member of Parliament until a year ago. People need to wake up and smell the coffee that uh, they can't just guarantee a vote unless they earn it. One big theme of the local elections was the rise of independent councillors, local candidates elected without any connection to the main parties. So how many people in this room are independent councillors? Wow. But here in Ashfield, in Labour's former Nottinghamshire heartlands, a mini earthquake saw independence seize overall control of the council, taking 30 of the 35 available seats. We've uh, capitalised on the national distrust of politicians over Brexit. So what made people abandon old allegiances and opt for free agents over familiar political brands? People have always voted Labour here and never seen any difference, and now they have seen a difference through the independence, so I think they're embracing a positive change. And do you think that the parties at national level should be worried about what's happened in Ashfield, as large numbers of voters have turned away from them and opted for independence? In a post-Trump, post-Brexit world, no political party should be safe. They shouldn't guarantee anybody's vote, and all politicians of all political colours should have to work for it, and I hope we are the wake-up call that politics needs. But for Jason, it was the truly local issues that mattered most. This is one of the things that's um, symptomatic of what happened in Ashfield. Part of the town centre regeneration, this clock was taken down, originally put up in 1960, so people felt like it belonged to them, you know, they've got lots of stories about meeting their first love here or having dates here. Uh, Labour took it down in 2014, a public went nuts, it belonged to them, they wanted it back, and they were just ignored. So as soon as we got in power, we dug it out of the depot, got a local builder to pay to refurbish it, and it's back where it belongs, and it's one of those things where big parties just aren't listening to local people anymore. Labour has enjoyed political dominance in this part of the country for years. Former Labour Council leader Cheryl Butler told us that Brexit, rather than local issues, was the main topic on the doorstep that many of the independents of Ashfield come from major parties and that despite badging themselves as independents, they often play politics more than others. Ashfield Labour can blame Brexit as much as they want. It's about a Labour Party locally who stopped listening many, many years ago. Recently, it's become about momentum and the moderates. And every debate, every day is based on one side trying to get points on the other. So unfortunately, residents and communities got ignored a long time ago because winning and deselecting became the things that, were, that mattered. Despite Labour's poor performance here, they kept control of nearby Nottingham City Council. But on the high street, we heard scant enthusiasm for any of the main parties. Independent was that back. They gave us a swimming pool. <laughs> they do get things done, they come round and talk to people. So could we be living through the end of a political culture of safe seats and loyal voters and the beginning of something much more volatile? Or is this earthquake just a tremor on the local political scene that will barely register on the national Richter scale? And we approached the Labour Party in Ashfield, their councillors and former councillors, but no one was available for interview. But, of course, we have the Labour peer, Andrew Adonis. Why do you think this is happening, the rise of independence? And, and particularly that um, councillor's point that actually Labour were, in this case, too involved in who's in, who's out, 
deselection, selection, and not concentrating on local issues. Well, there's a long, long tradition of independent councillors going back to the beginning of local governments, and it happens across the country. Oh, yeah, there, are some, there are some places... They've got over 600 seats yeah, in these there, local well, there's, elections. There's some, there's some places in the country where independents from time immemorial have run the councils. And as I see in, uh, when I look at different places in the country, there are different reasons why you have independents. Sometimes it's because there's a long independent tradition. Sometimes it's because of disputes in, in all of the different political parties. Sometimes it's very local issues. The thing I was really struck by in that report is there's clearly a big set of controversies about very local issues, you know, the location of the clock in the mm. town centre in Ashfield. Now, we all know from our own communities that there's nothing that generates more passion than those kinds of issues. And all I would um, say to my Labour colleagues in Ashford is I'd be looking very carefully at that clock. Right. It sounds as if uh, that was a, a big local issue. So you're not worried about the, uh, the rise oh, of everyone, the e Everyone should take note of when the voters speak. And if there are issues which they're, they're raising on the grounds which are leading them to vote for different parties, obviously they should. But I don't think we should think that independence being elected is a bad thing in our political system. It's, uh, it's, it's, it happens uh, across the country all the time. Ella? Yeah, sorry, the irony of that statement, you're saying you're listening when the voters speak. I think it's fantastic that there are an upsurge of independence. And I don't think it's any coincidence that after one of the biggest shake-ups in British politics, the Brexit vote, you suddenly have this spirit, this sentiment that people are saying things can be different and actually if I don't want to choose between two dead donkeys I can I can think of something myself I think that it's it, if we see more of this and the destruction of the two-party system and the crumbling alongside the crumbling of the main political parties that volatility that was described is hugely exciting you know anything could come in its place and I think this is a time for experimentation and openness in politics I mean isn't it another nail in the coffin for the two big parties as Ella says well in every country including this one we've inherited a party system that was invented in, a, in an earlier age, a pre-social media age, a more monolithic age, and they're all having to adapt. And uh, so, I, I mean, the idea that people are looking for more independent-minded local people is great, and if the political parties are listening to that, they will respond by giving more autonomy to their local parties, so that, as happens in the US, as happens in parts of Europe, a national party is more like a confederation of different local interest groups. I think if you did that, and by the way, if the, the, the party that is the first one properly to have a link between taxation, representation, and expenditure at local level, in other words, properly to devolve uh, self-financing to local councils, is going be way ahead in the, the race to win that because uh, people quite understandably want purpose and meaning to be restored to the ballot box at local level. I think it's a good thing but it injects kind of fresh energy into local authorities but uh, what you have to find is can they work together so you often have lots of different independents that have not a lot in common to be able to bring them together to get things done and lots of arguments so where I have seen uh, independent candidates or uh, UKIP candidates that or Greens that aren't part of the main two-party system it's been hard to get things done in some of those places um, but if you're a Tory candidate or you're a Labour candidate now the best thing you can do is go local in any election because the higher you rise into national arguments over momentum, moderates, you leave or remain with the Conservative Party, the higher you get, you, know, you get lost away from people. So the people really must go local in elections to have any. Well, not... Social media has got done a lot to help these people get their arguments across. If you think about local newspapers or local radio, you wouldn't have heard much from these independent councillors, but now you can connect with them instantly, and I think that's done a lot to help. All politics is local, and it's very, very important that parties are rooted in their localities. And in all my experience of politics, the parties that do best locally are those that are really plugged into the community and have as their councillors. So was this a verdict that neither of the two major parties were plugged oh, in? Both parties have, have always got to be constantly in touch with their grassroots and uh, where they are, uh, they generally can contain this, this surge towards independence. Slightly cautious about saying that this is all just about local issues. I think actually, as was mentioned in that package, Brexit was central to the question of why people are leaving the main parties. And I think it would be, you know, it would be wrong to suggest that people are just thinking within the narrow you know, scope of their postcodes or their council, that actually uh, national and international issues are very important to people. And the main uh, issue on the books of today is Brexit, and that, I think, is what is informing people's desire for a new kind of politics. So let's not just make this all about town clocks and things like that. I think well, people are slightly more forward-thinking than that. You can't do anything about that, and your party is your party. The only thing you can try and do is slightly separate. Some of the mayoral cam candidates, mm. actually, across the country have done a very good job mm. of having a very small logo attached to them and being on their own platform. People feel powerless. People feel that it doesn't matter how they vote at local level because nothing ever changes. And to some extent, that's a completely rational thing to feel. And, and we should be devolving meaningful power mm. to local councils so that we cease to be the most centralised country in Europe and we make local elections matter again. I'm going to agree with Daniel. I think oh. we do need more power at local level. I'm strongly in favour of directly elected mayors at local level too, which gives local people much more control over their affairs. All right, we're going to move on um, because I'm going to show you uh, the Daily Mirror and this article, um, which says that Labour is to pilot universal basic income scheme for everyone, rich or poor. Um, our guest on this is Dr Simon Duffy. He's part of UBI, Universal Basic Income Sheffield, and the founder and director of the Centre for Welfare Reform. Um, welcome. Tell us what universal basic income is, first of all. Basic income is really the idea that everybody would be guaranteed an income um, individual regular payments up front um, so that they can live, so everybody has a right to exist um, and that this should not be um, taken away um, or people should not be sanctioned or punished by the state but should be guaranteed this income. Right, we'll talk a little bit about that idea of, of living, existing if you like, and where the level should be, but your area Sheffield has been chosen by the Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell as a site where this idea will be tested out or piloted if Labour forms a government in the future. So you've obviously been lobbying hard, how difficult was it to persuade the Shadow Chancellor to actually take this idea on? Well, 
uh, the group, I think you slightly misnamed it, it's UBI Lab Sheffield, and the, the lab is important. So we're, we're not saying we know all the answers or that this will be the perfect solution. We're saying this is a really important idea that we should be testing out, and we think Sheffield is a brilliant place to test that out. The group has existed, really, it emerged out of conversations in the city of local people talking about what's important to them. And, um, yeah, we've been talking to Labour politicians locally and nationally for a few months. I think John McDonnell's interest in this idea um, and the interests of many leading thinkers uh, has been around for some time, so it's more of the coming together of two things than the direct result of our lobbying. Katie, what do you think about this idea? Because to some extent, we have talked about this in the past, but it's always felt as if it was an idea that was perhaps on the sort of margins of political debate. Do you think it's coming into the mainstream uh, a bit more? No, and I think um, <laughs> it's right not to. And I think it's one of those kind of kite-flying exercises that shows that we care about people outside of the bubble, but in reality, there's no kind of costing how it would be paid for. You know, why should footballers and bankers receive a ba basic state payment? Who ends up paying for this? The taxpayer ends up paying for this. I think it's a pretty mad idea. I mean, the lab um, that we just saw a minute ago is a hive of activity. There's nothing going on behind it, and I think that it's one of those empty kind of ideas that won't go anywhere fast. That's one about BBC Studios, but anyway, you okay. may be right. But yes, go on, Simon, respond to that. Well, uh... I mean, that's a ludicrous response to begin with because there have been lots of tested examples of this and there's been actually quite effective piloting uh, nationally, internationally of this idea. It's an idea that's been also being explored pi for piloting in Scotland. Um, so a lot of that, I'm not quite sure where to begin with. The reason why wealthy... <sighs> wealthy taxpayers like the David Beckhams should receive a basic income. Is, it's a bit like the NHS. Everybody should receive the basic guaranteed service. And of course, David Beckham et al. will pay more tax. And there's, without a doubt, it is a form of redistribution. But it's a form of redistribution in the context of an economy which is broken and in the context of runaway inequality. And what we're seeing is only the top over the last 40 years, only the top 10 to 15 percent of the income groups have seen their real incomes increase. All right. I mean, let's, 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 all right, let's just <laughs> hang on. What's it going to do? One at a time. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I was quite interested in this idea because it isn't just the far left that's pushing it. There are no. all sorts of Californian tech entrepreneurs who are saying it's the way to deal with AI. But it has been piloted. It has been trialled extensively. The most extensive trial being in Finland, yes. which just came to an end last year, and the case is closed. It didn't work. It didn't make people apply for more jobs. It didn't mean that they had the security to go and start the next Google in their garages. I mean, of course, the people getting the money were happy to get the extra money, but it didn't have any of the impacts that the uh, the supporters of it w were claiming. I have to say, the idea that the economy... I mean, we've got more people in work than ever. The, uh, every quartile has seen a rise. There is a debate about inequality, yeah. the types it's of it's jobs, and yeah, so but, on. But, but, but the way in... The best route out of poverty is a secure, well-paying job, not messing around with schemes like this. Andrew, we, but we, John McDonald's going to be trying it. We were saying earlier that one of our big problems in, in our political system is, is you can't get enough local experimentation and people doing things at local level and seeing how they work. What John McDonald is doing, I think, is absolutely in the localist tradition. We'll have a local trial. We'll do it in three cities. We can then test different versions of it to see how incentives work, what the level should be, what the tax effects are, and then we can take stock. I'm very surprised that having just come straight out of a debate about how people feel disempowered at the local level, what my colleagues on the panel are saying is, on no account should you allow any local initiative on one of the m biggest and most important things affecting people, which is their basic standard of living. It's, I, I think it's a, the investment of money should be spent elsewhere. So, for example, a local pilot, when anyone can fund a local pilot, how do you find this nationally is something completely different. But also, I'm more interested in those people that are going to work every day because work should pay. We should make sure that work should pay. It's a better alternative than doing nothing. We, we should make sure that they are on good salaries and we're up in productivity. Shouldn't be, but the, the question, I think, for me, is that this just doesn't go far enough. Because, I mean, the, lab, the, the rate at which the universal basic income would come at, the numbers, are, I mean, it's pretty poor. I'm talking about people's right to exist. I want people's right to thrive, to grow, to have a better quality of life for the future. I think this that it's, is it's phrased now. in terms of, this is phrased in terms of very radical intervention from John McDonnell. It's right, not it, radical. Well, that's the question. Right. I mean, uh, let's go back to Simon, because you were shaking your head while um, Dan was responding to you. Why? Well, I mean, some of those claims are just outrageous. Which when one? you think about well, if you think about, let's take the, the work capability assessment, which academics have shown has led to increased mental illness and increased suicides and increased tranquilizer use. That's a recent <laughs> reform to the benefit system. Un unemployment is very low, but the level of income that people are receiving is also very low. Mm. The UK has pulled off the unique trick of having high employment and high inequality and low productivity. And these things are connected. You will not get a transformed economy if you actually force people into really low-paid well, jobs and you enable uh, employers not to invest in the capital that will actually improve so the, productivity. The, the, so this is a broken uh, Somebody who strategy. lives on, on welfare in the UK now is better off than the average, the average worker in the 1930s. If you'd ask people then about universal basic income, they'd have thought, oh, they've got it already, right? In the, in the 21st century, what we would understand to be universal basic income from their perspective, we've already got it. And the reason that uh, living standards continue to improve, the reason that the hours that you have to work in order to afford basic services continue to drop is because of the uh, progress and the prosperity generated by a market economy. Simon? Go to a food bank and tell them that. Well, that that's just, that's, sorry, that's, that's a, an excuse for an argument. Uh, tell that to X is what you say when you don't have you, a, a, you've a, a, any logic. So, no, 
no, growing numbers of no, people are so, going so, to are, food. Are you saying that there is more poverty now? That there is more poverty on any normal metric of of hours worked, of what you being able to afford footwear, clothing? Because saying there are more food banks now, I'm afraid, is not an empirical measure of poverty. As the people who founded the growing death rates, growing suicides, these things are well documented by the Joseph Rowntree Fund, by the Institute of Fiscal Studies. You could read all sorts of things which will explain to you why the British economy is broken and why social justice in this country when is in severe crisis. When would you rather Do you want to go back 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? When do you think we were better off than now? I'd be interested to hear when you think the golden age But, Dan, it's not about... If it's just going to say, it's not about... We can compare, of course, life is better than it is today than it was in mm. the 1930s. Living standards have improved, but they haven't improved enough. And, I mean, if you, if you have lived on the dole, then you know what it's like. It's not a laugh. It's, and not just because it's not enough and people are just about existing, but also because you have no scope for improving the quality of your life. We should be thinking much bigger about these things. You've got a few seconds, Katie. Uh, I completely agree, actually, that we should be thinking bigger and wider and just paying people just to sit at home all day probably isn't the answer. Thank you to Simon oh. Duffy. That's all we've got time for. Goodbye.